Hello, explorers, and welcome to Reach the World's Explorer program. For 25 years, Reach the World has inspired youth to become curious, confident, and compassionate global citizens through virtual exchange. My name is Tim, and I'm so glad you're joining us for today's introductory video call for Arthi's expedition to French Polynesia. I'm so excited about this. Arthi Kanin is a marine biologist and Fulbright U.S. student program researcher who's currently studying how humans impact the fish, stingrays, and sharks off a remote atoll in French Polynesia. How cool is that? She's using some pretty amazing underwater cameras to investigate this underwater paradise. And lucky for us, she's taking Reach the World classrooms along for the journey over the course of the weeks to come. And I don't want to go too much into it because Arthi's here today with us today to introduce herself and tell us a little bit about what she's up to and where she's going to be taking us. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Arthi to Reach the World. Hey, Arthi. Hi, Tim. Nice to see you. Thank you for the introduction. Of course. Yes. It's so nice to have you here. You are in the U.S. right now, but you are preparing to go back to your field work in French Polynesia. And I'm so excited to sort of just introduce you and what you're doing and how you got to be doing what you're doing. And so maybe I we can start by sharing these cool pictures that you put together uh, and then we'll follow up with some questions afterwards. How does that sound? Yeah, that sounds perfect. All right, here we go. Tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> yeah, so this is, uh, this is a childhood photo. So, um, I grew up in India, uh, so I moved I moved from the U.S. to India when I was four years old, and I was in India from age four to age 18, and then I moved back to the U.S. for college. So over here, I'm about like, I think 10 or like 10 years old, and that's when I got my first dog, uh, and I've, I've had dogs ever since, and I've loved animals. And so, um, yeah, this is a picture of me and my younger sister uh, choosing a puppy, and um uh, yeah, I just thought I'd share that little piece of information. This is my family friend's house in India, uh, very close to me. And so, um, and this is me in school. This is actually like an 11th grade photo, me in high school. Um, and I'm wearing my school uniform. Uh, so we, we have uniforms there in India. And uh, yeah, this is just me after finishing one of a major exam. And I'm just, just relaxing with a friend. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and yeah, this is me, my sister, and my mom, my dad's not here in this particular photo, but I have another photo with him in it. Uh, but yeah, this is us wearing our Indian clothes. Uh, I'm wearing something called a sari, uh, and, uh, my sister's wearing something called a davani. And, um, if there's any Indians in the classroom, they might know what I'm talking about, but I just thought I'd share, uh, you know, uh, what we wear during different functions in India. And yeah, this is me with my dog and she's also here with me now. She's downstairs probably. Um, this is Muffin. And uh, yeah, this is me in my on my porch in India, in South India. That's my um, uh, childhood home. Uh, and I was about to leave, uh, go back to the US and go to the Amazon rainforest for some field work. And I just took a photo with her before I left. Um, so yeah, I went to Austin College for my uh, undergraduate degree and I studied biology. And uh, but I, I didn't just do that. I didn't just study biology. I tried to do a lot of different things. This is, I think, one of the first experiences uh, after I moved to the US for college. Uh, I volunteered with Global Brigades and they provide uh, medicines and healthcare to uh, impoverished communities around the world. So this is in Panama and uh, I'm taking a picture with me and some of my friends. Uh, who are volunteering, setting up a clinic for a very poor community so that they could have medicines. And yeah, this is one of my first experiences in Central America. And uh, it was it was wonderful. And it opened my eyes to traveling and uh, tropical places. Um, so this is me. Uh, <laughs> so, OK, so uh, another fun thing that I did in college was I was uh, the president of this biology interest group. Um, and we had a lot of fun events for kids like we would organize Halloween uh, 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 sort of uh, booths for kids in the neighborhood uh, around my around my university and uh, uh, we would go on hikes go fossil hunting look for fossils uh, on riverbeds and so one of the fun things that we did was we would decorate a golf cart and uh, uh, using you know we would make the things ourselves um, so we have a snake on top of the cart uh, we have an armadillo because it's Texas uh, that's where I went to college um, and that's me sitting in it after two days of just uh, nonstop paper mache and taping things to the cart. So, uh, yeah, this is just this is a picture of that. 
Um, so yeah, during my life, I did a lot of travel and uh, I love tropical places. Uh, I think being from India, I just naturally have this inclination to uh, enjoy being in tropical countries. So this is me in Madagascar um, holding a little baby chameleon. Um, Madagascar is a huge island and they have very unique species. I'm sure you guys have watched uh, uh, the movie Madagascar where they show you the lemurs. So lemurs are actually found nowhere else in the world. Uh, and so because it's an island, there's unique wildlife that isn't found anywhere else. So there's very unique chameleons, a lot of different species. And I'm just holding a baby chameleon in that photo. And that's a lemur <laughs> jumping on me. <laughs> They're very friendly. So um, yeah, so they were, they were not shy and they just jump all over you when they see you. And they're very light. They're, they, they're, they just reminded me of birds. That's how light their bones were. And so they're very agile. And yeah, they were just having fun with us. Yeah. And that's another lemur that <laughs> jumped on me and I wasn't prepared. So uh, that's why I look a little scared. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's me and my dad during uh, my college graduation. So um yeah, I uh, I just added this photo in after Madagascar. I graduated from uh, my university um, and my dad was really, really happy. And so he was just hugging me in that photo. But yeah. Um, so this is actually a really important person in my life. Um, his name is David and he was my professor and I worked in his genetics lab for three years. And uh, being from India, I didn't I didn't get the research experience that I wanted during my high school. Um, and so when I came to college, I discovered this whole world of research through through David. And um, I'm really grateful to him. Uh, I, I learned what doing science, doing real science is and experimenting and, you know, the, the joy of discovery when you find something new that no one else has found before in a lab. Like it, it was an amazing experience. And so I just had to add him in because he was it was a really important mentor in my life and I still I still keep in touch with him and uh, get his advice on many things. He he gave me a letter, a recommendation letter for my Fulbright experience in French Polynesia. So and yeah, this is me in the lab. Uh, I lived I lived in the lab for three years. I don't I think I spent all my winter breaks there. I just really loved doing science. And so uh, this is just me at my desk holding a plate um, of yeast. Do you guys know what yeast is? Yeast is a, uh, a microorganism. You know, it's found in bread. And so uh, we actually use yeast to uh, uh, as a model system. We delete genes, we add genes in, see what happens, see whether they grow on different types of like media, whether they grow on glucose or, you know, different sugar media. And so there's a lot of things we do with yeast in, in the world of genetics. And so this is me holding a yeast plate uh, and uh, because that's what I that's what I did for three years in college. So, um, yeah. And. David also offered a field course uh, during my time at Austin College, uh, during my undergrad in Trinidad and Tobago. And this was my first, my very first field experience, real field experience. And uh, I actually wasn't, didn't want to go the whole time. I wasn't sure about it. I heard there were like tarantulas and, you know, cockroaches and things like that. And I was like, oh, well, I don't know if this is a good idea, but I signed up for it. And I ended up going and it ended up transforming my life. I, I never realized what field work, uh, how enjoyable field work was or how enjoyable it was to be in nature and work with animals. Um, and so this is me with an endangered leatherback turtle. They're one of the biggest turtles in the world and uh, they're endangered. They have, they have a relatively soft shell and, so, um, uh, and they're very unique. So this one is laying eggs. And when turtles lay eggs, they go into a trance. And so they're not conscious. And it's okay to touch them gently when they're laying eggs, not, uh, but it's not advised, you know, when, without experts around you. So that's just me lightly touching its head while it's laying eggs. It can't, it doesn't, it can't see me or doesn't know I'm there, but yeah, this was, um, and this was at night. We did a night hike through uh, a tropical um, island to the beach and we looked for turtles with our red lights. Uh, white lights are not good for turtles. And we found this one and, and we were just observing observing uh the turtle lay eggs um and yeah this is a picture of me with the entire team in trinidad and tobago um and uh yeah that's that's my professor david on the on the left and uh all of those are people are my classmates and we actually lived with fishermen and they were cooking us food um and there was there were no other humans in this island uh it was just us and so and we were just living in huts we were just in in harmony or in touch very in touch with nature and so this was just a wonderful experience with all of these wonderful people um and yeah that experience really changed me um so 
I took that uh, with me and wanted to look for programs that would um, help me get back into nature, help me get back into doing field work, uh, studying uh, wildlife and trying to find ways to conserve them. And so um, I found a program at Yale University uh, and there's a school in Yale University called the Yale School of Environment. Um, and that's where I did my uh, master's in environmental science. And so that's just me standing outside my school, uh, taking a photo. Uh, this was probably uh, two years ago. Um, and at the Yale School of Environment, I got to do a lot of really cool things that, uh, that I was interested in. Um, so I, uh, so scientists usually write applications, they write, uh, you know, proposals to get money to do uh, the research that they want to do. And so Yale University awarded me with a couple of grants and I went to India to study uh, wolves. And, um, and a lot of people don't know, but there's, there's uh, two to three different species of wolves in India. Um, and there's the, the wolf that I focused on is critically endangered. Uh, they're getting wiped out, unfortunately, and I really wanted to study them. And they're called the Indian wolf. Uh, and, uh, it's, and they live in, a, so if you look at the background, they live in these dry, arid areas, um, like deserts almost. Um, they don't live in the forests, uh, like the wolves in the U S. Um, and right behind me, you can see these sloth bears. Um, and there's a, there's a mama sloth bear with, uh, three cubs and it was very special. These bears are very unique. Uh, they carry their young on their back, like a backpack. And so this is just me posing with, with the bear. I was really excited that day to see it. Uh, so, and yeah, for my field work, for my master's, uh, what I did for my research, I collected, I actually collected poop. I collected wolf, it's, we call it scat. Um, I collected wolf poop or scat. And um, I actually ended up collecting more than 800 different um, uh, wolf scat specimens. And we store them in these uh, little Ziploc bags. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, the, and I did that so that I could an genetically analyze them. I wanted to use my genetics experience from my college to try to save these wolves. And so, um, we collected these samples, we go to a lab, we, uh, have a, a DNA sequencer and we try to extract information. We try to identify how many wolves are in this one area and, uh, is this area, could it hold more wolves? Are the wolves doing well here? So there's a lot of questions we can ask using, uh, using poop. And so, um, that's what I did for three to four months in India for my master's degree at Yale. And this is just a picture of uh, me attending a workshop. It's called, okay, this is going to be a big, big terminology, stakeholder engagement. But basically what that means is we work with, um, we work with people who live in areas that are near forests or near sensitive areas that wildlife also use. So we work with people and uh, try to mitigate or try to, you know, come up with solutions so that they can live with the wildlife around them peacefully. Like if you can imagine, it might be difficult for people to live near an area with a lot of bears. And so we try to work with them um, so that the humans and wildlife can coexist. So this is a workshop teaching me the tools to be able to communicate with people um, and uh, help them coexist with the wildlife around them so that uh, we don't have any, so that there's no um, devastating consequences on either side. We, we can save both the humans and the wildlife. Um, so during my time at Yale University, I actually got to do uh, a really uh, cool experience. Um, so I got to go to the Amazon rainforest. Um, and this is me in the front. You can see me in the front. Uh, and uh, the guy who's taking the photo is Pablo. He was he was basically keeping us alive in the Amazon rainforest. He's from Ecuador. Uh, and uh, we are on a canoe in the um, uh Tiputini River. I hope I, I, some of you might have heard of it. And it's a really murky river, really muddy. You don't see what's in the water until it comes out. And in this river, you have anacondas, you have uh, giant river otters, you have pink river dolphins. And uh, maybe I might share some of those photos later on. But this was the most magical experience I've ever had. I, until I went to French Polynesia, I, I would just fell in love with the Amazon rainforest. And, uh, and, how, and this is the most diverse place on earth. And so um, I really enjoyed my time here. I was studying the plants, but I got to witness the dolphins, the otters, the anacondas. Uh, there were slots in the trees. There were uh, really unique species of monkey. And um, it was just an amazing place. I, I, and a piece of my heart will always be there. Um, and yeah, this is me holding the plant that I was studying for uh, my other master's thesis uh, in addition to the wolves. And so I was studying tropical plants for some time and I was studying how uh, I was studying how diverse they are and how they how they grow throughout 
a, a forest patch in the Amazon rainforest. And yeah, that's just me posing, posing with the plant. My professor took that photo. Yeah. Yeah. And then after Yale, well, uh, this is my uh, graduation ceremony at Yale uh, for my master's degree. Um, I had gotten the information that I got selected uh, as a Fulbright student and I was getting awarded. And I was really excited to, um, to go into this new marine biology path. And uh, for my graduation, I wanted to decorate my hat and put sharks on it because I knew that's what I was going to be doing very soon. And so that's me posing outside my apartment in New Haven uh, with, with my cap. And um, yeah, that's just me walking down, uh, uh, getting, my, getting my degree, graduating. Uh, my parents were really happy that day. Um, and shortly after the graduation ceremony, I got dive certified. So you might think that I'm, I'm an expert marine biology, you know, uh, scientist, and I'm really good at diving. And, uh, since I'm in French, since I've been in French Polynesia for the last couple of months, but no, I, I got dive certified right before I left. It was, it was very new to me. And, uh, yeah, this is just me getting my, uh, uh, getting my certificate for my, uh, for diving. And in case I ever needed to dive in French Polynesia for my research. And so, um, yeah, it was all, all a new beginning. And uh, after getting dive certified, I was invited to attend a Fulbright conference uh, in Paris. And that was my first time going to France. Um, and this is me being very touristy and cliche, pos posing outside the Eiffel Tower at night when it glitters. And so um, I was with some other Fulbright awardees that night. And uh, it was it was fun. I just... Uh, I wanted to put that in since I attended the Fulbright conference in Paris and uh, thought it would be nice to show you. Um, and yeah, this is a photo of me the first day in Tahiti. And so uh, just a little bit of information. Um, French Polynesia Polynesia is uh, is sort of like a part of France, even though it's a different country and it has its own culture. Um, uh, France sort of owns a lot of things in French Polynesia and um, a lot of people speak French. So I um, flew. It was a long journey. Uh, French Polynesia is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. There's nothing around it. Um, I just landed after a really long flight and uh, checked into the hotel next to the airport. And um, yeah, I was exhausted, but I was so happy to be there. They greeted me with the garland that you can see on my neck. Um, and uh, and when you fly to French Polynesia, you, you, you usually go to a place called Papete um, in Tahiti. And, it, and Tahiti is the biggest island in French Polynesia. And that's where I landed first. Uh, that's where I started my journey um, in French Polynesia. And so I uh, just wanted to share that. Um, and yeah, within within just three to four days, I was uh, I, uh, I I was I started my work. And this is me and my team uh, at the University of Washington. I'm wearing a University of Washington shirt, too. So that's my professor right behind me in the hat. Um, the guy driving the boat, he's the ranger that I work with uh, on a daily basis and has helped me uh, a lot with my field work on sharks. And so, yeah, we just took a fun photo. This was the end of a long day of uh, catching sharks and inserting GPS tags in them. And uh, yeah, and we were really happy because we we were su we successfully tagged uh, a couple of sharks and we didn't harm them. Uh, they were they were released safely and they were uh, safe and sound. And so we were just really happy that day. And uh, yeah, this is, um, um, so this is another thing that I, I should have mentioned earlier, uh, that the, the previous photo was not in Tahiti, it's in a remote atoll called Tetiaroa, which is 35 miles off of the coast of Tahiti. And so you get there on a ferry, it's a two hour ferry. And so that's where I, uh, that's where I took that photo and you can see the lagoon around me. Uh, so over here, this is the wet lab, um, or this is the outdoor lab uh, in Tetiaroa for scientists to use. And um, they had just, they had just uh, captured a couple of baby turtles that had gone astray and they were getting distracted with the lights. And uh, so turtles usually follow light. Um, and they get distracted and they don't go into the ocean uh, like they're supposed to. And so uh, they rescued a couple of baby turtles and I'm just holding a little baby turtle gently on my palm, uh, posing for the camera. So uh, it was just a really lovely moment. Um, they're, they're incredibly cute and adorable. Yeah. And uh, yeah, this is me. Uh, I, so by now I've done like a hundred field days and uh, deployed. What I do on a daily basis is I deploy GoPros. Uh, if you guys know, those are waterproof cameras. I deploy uh, GoPros in the water at different locations to capture, um, you know, videos and pictures of sharks so that I can study them. 
And you'll see a couple of those photos soon uh, that I've taken with with those GoPros. Um, but yeah, this is me with my friends and a ranger uh, after a long field day of deploying cameras from like 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. And uh, it was raining that day and it was just, you know, uh, we were just all the all the harsh conditions. But we were so happy to be out in the lagoon and finish our work. So, um, yeah, this is just me with my friends uh, posing. And, um, yeah, this is my first ex <laughs> So that's a photo of me on a whale watching boat. It was a really tiny boat. Uh, and uh, so because it's really tiny and I was sitting on the top, um, the waves were just, you know, if, if you stand up, you just fall off the boat into the ocean. So I was trying to be really careful. And the guy was really nice. And he let me try to ride, to try to drive the boat. And we were going from Tetiro to Tahiti at a low speed. So it took five hours. And so I got to learn a little bit about how to navigate a boat uh, with, you know, really big waves and so it was just, it was a really fun day um and um yeah as i mentioned this is uh this is the atoll so uh this is one sh this is a channel between two islands and we call it a hoa and so it's a little narrow channel that uh, uh i'll have a map in the future so i can show you where this is exactly but hoas are some of the most beautiful uh places in atolls they're in they're very beautiful as you can tell right behind me and so um and Usually baby sharks like to live in the hoas because they're very shallow and it's harder for for adult sharks to get in. Adult sharks can eat the baby sharks. Uh, baby sharks are basically like small fish to the adult sharks. And so baby sharks like to stay in these hoas protected from, uh, from the adult sharks. And so I was walking around the hoas looking at the baby sharks, trying to gauge how old they were. Did uh, Was there a recent um, uh, did an adult shark recently give birth to any sharks in the Hoa? And uh, just, I, I like to study their activity levels. How active are they at different times of the day? And so that's me walking around the Hoa. Um, so yeah, this is really cool. So this is what I do on a daily basis. Um, so the GoPro uh, captures these amazing footage of uh, of the sharks. And I would, I, I'd like to ask, you know, what, what kind of shark do you guys think this is? And maybe in my next, next uh, um, uh, conference, I can, I can answer that question, but um, just, so this is uh, a reef shark. I'll, I'll tell you that. And, um, and they're the dominant shark in this lagoon. They're the biggest sharks in this particular uh, lagoon of the Tetiaroa Atoll. And, uh, and yeah, there's, there's these fishes called remoras that you can see swimming underneath them. Remoras usually, uh, they, um, uh, they benefit from the sharks. They usually uh, attach themselves to the shark. Um, and, and yeah, so you can see in the video, uh, there's a cage and it's filled with sardines, like dead fish. And the reason we put sardines in it is because sardines are oily and um, they attract sharks. And so this is a very um, non-invasive, uh, uh, disturbance-free way of studying sharks by inserting cameras with a with a with a with fish bait and um, if shark just comes near the camera we get a we get a cool video that we can study the behavior of later um, and the sharks just swim away and we don't disturb them and I, I really like this method of studying sharks and other marine life we can also study fishes stingrays and several other marine species using this method so yeah this is a really cool photo of a huge shark um, and as you can see, we get information on other species too, not just the sharks. Th these are uh, fishes called giant trevally, and um, and seeing the ones that are black are pretty rare. And so this was a really cool photo of uh, uh, a black giant trevally. And I'll talk about this more as uh, as you follow me on my journey in French Polynesia. And this is another species of reef shark. And uh, yeah, I want to ask, what shark do you think it is? And maybe. Um, if you, we could talk about it later in my next conference, but, um, yeah, this, this is another common species of shark, uh, of reef shark in, in the Tetiaroa lagoon. Um, and as you can see, there's a stingray right at the bottom. So this was a cool photo that I captured with, with the GoPros. Um, so in addition to doing science in French Polynesia, in, in the Tetiaroa Atoll, I make friends. I, the, uh, I learn from them. I try to learn French. Uh, French is the uh, one of the major languages in French Polynesia, in addition to Tahitian, Tahitian is also another language that they speak in uh, French Polynesia. So um, at the atoll, there's a lot of people from France. Uh, and so I'm trying to, I, I try to learn French from my friends. They try to learn, uh, my native language is Tamil. They try to learn Tamil from me. It's a South Indian language. Um, and uh, I eat a lot of French food over there. Uh, I'm vegan, so it's hard because there's a, uh, it's hard to find vegan food 
French vegan food, but I try, I, I try my best. And so I also make food for them uh, from my country. And so this is me making uh, lentils. Uh, it's called, it's a dish called Rajma Masala for my friends. And, uh, and because of me, they've learned to really like Indian food. And so this is me cooking in the wet lab, in the outdoor lab uh, for, for all of the scientists and rangers and uh, my teammates. Uh, and um, in addition to doing my uh, shark project and uh, hanging out with my friends and learning from them and them learning from me, uh, I get to visit a lot of really cool places. And so uh, this is called, this is Creo. This is one of the major marine uh, uh, biology organizations of French Polynesia. And it's a, it's a French marine biology institute in an island called Murea. So I mentioned Tahiti. And I mentioned that there's an atoll that I work on 35 miles away from Tahiti. And right next to Tahiti, there's another island called Murea. Um, and uh, it's it's a really beautiful island with huge mountains. It looks like Jurassic Park. And so I had a really fun time in Murea. I visited uh, Creo, the Marine Biology Institute, where we have a lot of scientists working on sharks, uh, coral reefs, fishes, all sorts of marine organi uh, organisms. And so, yeah, I'm just, I'm just posing with the Creo banner. And I uh, was really grateful to make a visit down there and meet the scientists over there. And um, and yeah, one thing that we love to do in Teti Roa is we watch the sunset. It's um, as you can imagine, it's 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 magical. And so after a long day of field work in the lagoon, um, or you know, walking around the Motu and hiking, I also help with um, their mosquito research, which is it's just pretty tough. Like you you're sweating a lot walking around the. Motus walking on large coconut leaves, which aren't very comfortable. And so after a long day of work, um, of really good work, we just like to chill by and watch the sunset. And so this is me with my friends. I'm lying down. I'm like the s second person on the left. Um, I'm just exhausted. And yeah, we're just relaxing, uh, watching the sunset. And so I just wanted to share that. <laughs> That is amazing. Are they, I have a thousand questions after what you just spoke about. I feel like any one of those slides um, it has its whole interesting story. I'm super jealous that you got to see a leatherback turtle, for example. That's so cool. They're so rare. And it's fun to get a preview of this journey that we're going to go on with you together as you go back to French Polynesia and continue your field work there. Where are you going like in the next few weeks? What can we sort of uh, expect as we check in with you um, and your journey back to French Polynesia? Yeah, of course. Yeah, thanks, Tim. So um, in a couple of days, I'm going back to Tahiti. Uh, and that's the photo of me with the garland. You know, that's that's where uh, I took the photo. So flying back to Papete in Tahiti. Um, and from there, I will immediately hop on a boat to Tetiaroa. And I know it's a hard name to say. I'll, I'll maybe have some visual aids to help with that. Uh, but yeah, Tetiaroa Atoll. Uh, I'll hop on a boat that's two hours from Tahiti and I go back to work uh, every day, just sort of uh, dropping in those uh, waterproof cameras, getting the videos of the sharks. Um, in addition to that, I'm going to spend a lot more time with the hoas this time in the channels where the baby sharks like to uh, hide from the adult sharks. Uh, so I, I think I'll be spending a lot of time there. Um, I actually had, I, I didn't include a photo, but I just come back from Bora Bora and, uh, I, right before I came here. And so in Bora Bora, I got to swim with sharks. Um, uh, I got to see like 40 or 50 different eagle rays. Uh, and, uh, I got to see a manta ray. A manta ray is huge. Um, they're enormous. Uh, they're really beautiful. I'll make sure to include some pictures of that next time. And so I just come back from Bora Bora, but now when I go back, yeah, I, it's, it's work, uh, all day in Tetiroa, and uh, I might um, fly off to these islands called the Tuamotu Islands. They're part of French Polynesia, and it's the world's uh, best. It's it's called the world's best dive site, and it's almost like the ocean is just. It, it's almost like humans never impacted the oceans, and they don't even exist. It's it's just uh, a huge marine world that's just intact, and so it's one of the best places to see the ocean in its real state uh unaffected undisturbed state so i might be going over there to do some diving i i'm not sure yet but i will at some point and i'll have really cool videos and photos to share uh with you all wow that sounds great i can't wait to experience that along with you i feel so lucky that you're going to take us with you uh, i'm going to add to the bottom of the screen the link to your reach the world virtual exchange homepage, where over the course of the coming weeks you're going to be adding articles and photos um, from different aspects of your journey, meant for teachers and students to use as they sort of prepare for our next chance to talk to you live, which won't be in the U.S., will be 
In French Polynesia. In, in French Polynesia. That's so exciting. Yeah, of course. I'm, I'm, I'll be happy. I'll try to, um, I'll try to take the laptop to the beach and like show you the lagoon while I, while I talk about the sharks in it. Um, yeah, I'll try to do something fun for the next meeting. <laughs> That's amazing. And sort of as one final question today, before we let you go, what is it about sharks in particular that you find so interesting? I know students are going to want to know, like sharks, aren't you scared? Like, what, what is it of all the animals that you could study? Why is it sharks? Oh, there's a lot I can say about that. So as you can probably tell, I didn't start out um, studying anything marine. I didn't start out studying uh I'm not from a marine biology background before this, even though I'm a PhD student studying marine biology now, uh, I have a more terrestrial uh, background, but but you could probably tell, I, I used to study tigers, uh, wolves, and, uh, and leopards, and so they're all predators. And so uh, ever since I was a kid, I've always been interested in predators. And um, I always wanted to understand why predators are important for the ecosystem and why they should exist. Um, and I wanted to raise awareness for their importance because Predators are oftentimes hunted down. They're oftentimes uh, the first to go extinct. And so uh, I, I really wanted to study them. And I was when I was a kid, I've always I've always been interested in predators. And so um, and uh, uh, predators such as wolves, for example, they impact every aspect of the ecosystem. So if you look at Yellowstone National Park in the U.S., um, wolves actually help the beaver population when they introduced wolves back into the national park. Uh, the beaver population increased. The coyote population stabilized and went a bit down. Uh, there were all these small carnivores that are, that looked like ferrets that uh, also came up, like their population increased. And the native vegetation, like the plants that are naturally supposed to be, they're not invasive plants or not weeds, the native plants, um, they started to flourish because the wolves were back. So there's all of these crazy connections to predators. And so the entire ecosystem improves when predators are in their space, in, where they're supposed to be. And so I really wanted to apply this or study this in a marine environment because in a, in a marine environment, there's many more players involved. Marine environments are very, very complex. Like for example, if you look at Yellowstone, there's a wolf, there's wolf and then there's two, maybe two types of deer that they prey on. But in a marine environment, there's like hundreds of different species of fish, uh, stingrays, crabs, so many things that the sharks could eat. Um, we're just starting to understand all of these connections and why sharks are important and how they're important for the survival of other species like the fish, crabs, stingrays, um, dolphins, like other species that exist in the in the ocean. And there have been some studies on the importance of sharks and uh, how they improve coral reefs, for example. Coral reefs are basically the tropical rainforest of the oceans. Without the coral reefs, we won't survive as a species. Humans will not exist because uh, coral reefs are... Is, is they're sort of like running running the world <laughs> so they're really important um so sharks right. yeah the sharks help coral reefs a lot and so um uh i was really interested in understanding how they're important why we should save them sharks are persecuted in other countries there's um french polynesia is amazing because sharks are protected and people are not allowed to mm -hmm. fish sharks uh but in other parts of the world sharks are fished for shark fin soup um for uh, their skin, for different products, and um, and it's really sad, but unfortunately, that's that's the reality. Um, sharks are uh, the popular the numbers of sharks are decreasing throughout the world, and mm -hmm. so I really wanted to sort of uh, try to do my part. My part might be small, but I just wanted to study them and try to conserve them, raise importance, uh, raise awareness for how important they are to the oceans, and so. Yeah, that's why I'm interested in sharks. It's a long answer. I have a lot more to say, but yeah, I will say it in the next uh, couple of conferences. Yeah, that is amazing. It has been so nice to get to know you and hear and see a little bit about how you came to be a practicing field science scientist and see just enough to know like the amazing adventure that lies ahead for all of us as we follow you in your trip back to French Polynesia. I'm going to put one more link up on the screen. Um, this is a link that educators can go to to sign up for the full virtual exchange with Arthi and her expedition to French Polynesia. Um, we can make sure you see all the articles when they're published and know exactly when our next uh, live stream events with Arthi are going to be. So if you're a teacher watching today, make sure you sign up. Uh, and follow the whole virtual exchange. Um, that's about all the time we have today, Arthi. That was amazing. Uh, teachers, students, this is just the beginning. Like I said, be sure to sign up so you don't miss anything that's coming up. Uh, share the registration form. It's ticking along the bottom of your screen right now. 
and we'll have a lot more opportunities to connect live with our the in French Polynesia in the weeks ahead. So thanks again for watching today. Arthi, safe travels back to French Polynesia. I'm so excited to learn more from you. Thank you so much, Tim. Sounds great. And I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing everyone next time. All right. Thanks, Arthi. Thank you.